Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Espresso with Carlo with our dear friend David Weprin. Uh, David, you're no stranger to the Building Congress and our events, so it's great to see you and obviously thank you for your support over the years. Let me start by thanking our sponsors for today. Bravo, Global Infrastructure Solutions, Halmar, Langen, Siame Construction, STV Group, and Suffolk. Thank you all. Um, let me just jump into our conversation here, and I'm going to do a brief introduction of David. Uh, David, let you say a couple of words, and then we'll do questions. Um, David Reprin is currently a New York State Assembly member for District 24, which is Jamaica Hills, Richmond Hill, Oakland Gardens, and Queens. Uh, the Weprin family is no stranger to Queens um, or to New York City, honestly. His brother Mark uh, was an assembly member and obviously his father Saul of blessed memory was an assembly member and a leader in the New York State Assembly for many years. Prior to serving in the assembly, David was New York City Council member in Queens from 2001 to 2009 and he served as chair <coughs> excuse me, of the powerful finance committee. Uh, David Weprin monitored public spending and strengthened fiscal responsibility throughout the city. Um, he's also had a career as a deputy superintendent for banks, secretary of the banking board for New York State under Governor Mario Cuomo, um, and really has worked as a watchdog for nearly two trillion um, for uh, financial institutions and service firms across the state. So David, you clearly understand the, the role of controller and we'd love to hear from you before we take some questions. So it's my uh, to talk to David Weber. Uh, absolutely, Carlo. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity. And uh, as you mentioned, I'm no stranger uh, to the New York Building Congress. Uh, I've been involved with you. Uh, you know, going back probably about 20 years. Uh, and um, I actually uh, chaired the finance committee uh, of the city council for eight years uh, and worked very closely uh, with the building Congress uh, and uh, supported, uh, you know, various capital projects for infrastructure needs, uh, uh, putting people to work uh, and having a, a long-term uh, vision for New York City. And uh, I want to congratulate you and the building Congress uh, for all your leadership uh, over the years, uh, trying to uh, you know have a having a vision uh, for New York City and uh, and sponsoring so many uh, important uh, programs, and and I know your all your members are all deeply interested uh, in the future of New York City. Um, you know, of all the candidates running for controller, uh, I think I'm the only one uh, uniquely qualified uh, with a, a relevant finance experience, uh, both public and private sector. Uh, you know, on Wall Street, uh, I was in municipal finance, uh, an important part of the controller function. Uh, controller is, uh, as you know, is chief financial officer of the city, in charge of the debt issuance of the city, the long-term capital uh, budget. And that's something I did on Wall Street for 20 years uh, with DLJ, Kidder Peabody, Payne Weber, uh, major firms, uh, all uh, dealing with tax exempt bond issues uh, with New York City uh, being one of those uh, clients as well. Um, you know, I'm, I've been saying certain things that I don't think uh, other people have been saying. For one, uh, I'm committed to uh, opening up uh, an office in every borough. Uh, we're a five borough city. I think we should be a five borough controller's office. We have almost 800 employees. Uh, there's no reason why they all have to be uh, situated in the municipal building in downtown Manhattan. And I'd like to use those um, borough offices uh, as a laser focus to try to help small businesses because uh, we're suffering uh, from this pandemic and we're not gonna really fully get back uh, to work. Obviously we got help from Washington that's gonna play, go a long way this year uh, in helping us with our city and state budget. But I don't know if that's gonna last more than this year. Uh, and we're anticipating uh, multi-billion dollar deficits uh, in the next number of fiscal years. Uh, and I think it starts with small businesses and bringing back the tax base, uh, and, uh, you know, and trying to, uh, you know, get uh, uh, get people back to work. But uh, but also we need to help small businesses as well as uh, large businesses. So uh, I've always been uh, committed uh, 
you know, um, you know, to to the economy, to uh, to helping uh, the business community. Uh, you know, I'm like to consider myself a, a moderate. Uh, I know a lot of my opponents uh, have been spending a lot of time on uh, talking about defunding the police. Uh, I'm not one of those. Uh, I think it's important. As you know, we've had uh, an increase in crime in many neighborhoods. And I think it's important that we have uh, sufficient police presence. Uh, when I was uh, in the city council, we actually uh, also uh, had um, a lot of uh, police and, and fire laid off. And, uh, you know, with the uh, post 9-11, and we actually brought back most of those employees. <coughs> I think it's a mistake uh, to uh, cut police classes, as was done last year. And I know they're talking about potentially, you know, delaying other classes uh, of uh, incoming police. So, uh, so I'm one that's concerned about uh, the effect on reducing headcount. Uh, I supported all the police reforms in Albany, and uh, I think uh, everybody was uh, relieved uh, by the verdict that we just had uh, uh, the other day uh, in, you know, in the uh, George Floyd, uh, you know, murder trial. And uh, you know, hopefully that'll that'll help. Uh, you know, to calming down, but that should not affect uh, us significantly, uh, you know, um, not reducing uh, police headcount. So that's one of the things I've been saying. Um, also, the uh, city charter only requires uh, the control that ordered some aspect uh, of every city agency once every four years. That's certainly not enough. Uh, I'd like to see uh, all, all city agencies audited every year or every year and a half if possible. Uh, and I, the other thing is uh, the outside contracting budget of the city of New York, uh, which is about 20 percent now uh, of the budget, uh, has really uh, got, got, gotten out of hand. And, uh, and a lot of those uh, contracts are not sufficiently audited. Uh, you know, uh, the, the one that got the most publicity uh, in The New York Times expose uh, was the Bronx Housing Parent Network, which had a two billion dollar uh, homeless shelter uh, contract. Uh, and you, you, you read about Victor Rivera, who was involved in a lot of uh, insider dealings, uh, enriching uh, him and his family members. Uh, and he, he actually was uh, accused, uh, you know, by dozens and dozens uh, of women in the homeless shelter system, you know, of sexual assault. Uh, that obviously is being investigated now. But the, uh, the Bronx Housing Parent Network, uh, as one of the largest outside contracts in the city uh, at $2 billion, uh, should have been audited, and, and they really weren't. Uh, and uh, it took a New York Times expose uh, to uh, to find that corruption and uh, and find all all of that waste. Uh, I'd also um, Department of Education is the largest uh, budget that we have. Uh, that's actually about has about an eight billion dollar uh, outside contracting budget. Department of Ed. Uh, I think we can audit some of those large contracts and find savings. Uh, and I'd like to use uh, that savings, the money that we find uh, from that, uh, and actually put it back into the classroom to hire more uh, teachers, more guidance counselors, more social workers, which are going to be particularly needed uh, as we get all of our students back to work, back to school rather. And, um, you know, and certainly uh, many of them have suffered significantly uh, during this pandemic. Uh, this uh, remote learning on and off uh, has been has been damaging. Uh, and when you're dealing with uh, students with disability, uh, they've been the uh, the biggest victims of the remote learning because they uh, they haven't really uh, been able to adapt to it. Uh, and I think it's important we get uh, everybody back to uh, school safely. And with the vaccine getting out, uh, I think that certainly should be we should be back to normal in, in September. Uh, and uh, you know I think uh, the controller can play uh, a role there, uh, you know through the audit function. Well, it sounds like you've got a plan ready to hit the ground running on day, day one, David. Um, you know, look, the fiscal crisis that came from the pandemic, we're not sure what the future will bring, right? We don't know what the next few years, how our budget will be. Tell us how you plan to work with the next mayor to keep New York on a sound financial footing. Well, you look, um, you know, certain Certain times we have to work together and other times, uh, you know, the control is a check on the mayor and the mayor's agencies and the check on the mayor is more uh, with the audit function, uh, reviewing all contracts with the city uh, and potentially uh, signing some and not signing others. Uh, but I think it's important that we do work together 
uh, to bring back uh, the economy, to bring back uh, the business community. Um, you know, I, I think it starts with getting people back to work. Uh, and I think actually one of the uh, recent announcements that Mayor de Blasio made, which I uh, support, was a, was a good one, uh, was to uh, bring back to work uh, someday coming up very soon, uh, you know, in person, uh, safely, uh, those employees that are under his direct control. And I really think we're not going to be back uh, to normal until uh, we, we get workers, we get all our uh, citizens and businesses uh, back to work in person. We obviously have a lot of major buildings, uh, you know, all over Manhattan uh, that are empty or almost, uh, you know, uh, almost empty. And uh, I think we really have to get, you know, that tax revenue back on the books uh, and we have to get people back to work uh, safely, which can now be done uh, with the vaccine distribution. And uh, that's been, you know, beefed up and made a priority by the uh, federal government. We're getting the vaccines. Uh, we've lowered the age to 16. Uh, there's really no excuse uh, not to get everybody vaccinated. Uh, and I would hope uh, within a couple of months, uh, we'll have 80% uh, or 90% uh, of our city residents uh, vaccinated. And, uh, and I think that's going to go a long way uh, to getting the economy going uh, and getting people back to work. I was one of the uh, first elected officials to argue significantly uh, to, bring, uh, to open up uh, restaurants in New York City. Uh, I know uh, suburbs uh, were open safely uh, much earlier uh, than New York City. Uh, I had a press conference uh, over the summer uh, demanding that uh, you know New York City uh, be treated the same way as the, as our suburbs because uh, if you can bring back restaurants safely uh, first on a limited basis, then gradually building up. If you can do that safely in in Nassau County or Westchester County, there's no reason why we can't do it uh, in our five boroughs. And and I was a strong voice. Uh, for the small business community, for the uh, restaurant community. Uh, and of course, they, they, they also recently got aid in Washington, uh, which I supported. So uh, I will work with the mayor uh, as much as I can to bring back uh, businesses uh, and to get everybody back to work and back to school. That was great. You know, our, our, one of our biggest focuses, obviously, is infrastructure and rebuilding. Um, and I know you've talked about that in your career. Give us a sense <clears throat> what our members can expect with U.S. city control in terms of infrastructure and the capital budget and, and rebuilding New York, really? Yeah, I think it's important, um, you know, long term uh, to, uh, you know, continue and expand uh, on the capital budget. Uh, budget. Um, you know, also there were um, a number of um, projects that were uh, that, that went down. Uh, I'll give you the Amazon as, as an example. I was one of the uh, few elected officials that was a vocal supporter uh, of the uh, Amazon project to uh, build their uh, he second headquarters uh, in Long Island City. Uh, they were going to create 25,000 new high paying jobs with an average salary of 150,000. It's very short sighted uh, for elected officials to kind of scare them out of town. Uh, can you imagine uh, how useful those jobs would be now? They would have been underway already. Uh, and, uh, you know, there would have been construction jobs as well, you know, with building the headquarters, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, there would have been, uh, you know, high paying jobs. They would have uh, created a new industry, uh, a new tax base. Uh, and that, and that's, that, that's a tremendous loss uh, uh, to the city. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been, you know, pro projects, pro business, uh, pro infrastructure projects, and, and I'm hoping uh, we're going to get, you uh, you know, the large infrastructure project uh, coming from Washington. And uh, obviously I will support that. Uh, but once we get that, we have to uh, really uh, take advantage of uh, the best use, you know, of that and, and make sure that we get, you know, our fair share and, uh, and we, we create construction jobs, but it, permanent jobs as well. You know, I was a, a big supporter uh, of uh, Mayor Bloomberg's proposal on, uh, on the Jet Stadium, the Dome Stadium which would have created a tremendous amount uh, of jobs. That was during my tenure uh, in the city council. It would have created uh, construction jobs as well as uh, permanent jobs. Uh, and I think it would have been a great thing uh, for downtown Manhattan, uh, you know, for midtown Manhattan rather, uh, you know, attached to the Javits Center. It would have been great uh, for conventions. Uh, you know, we have to uh, bring tourism back now after the pandemic, uh, and that should be a major priority. I know uh, the mayor just had an announcement about that, but I think, uh, 
as controller, I'd like to uh, do everything in my power uh, to work to uh, bring back tourism, which uh, was one of our biggest industries uh, in New York City uh, and obviously uh, has been devastated uh, by the pandemic. Agreed. It's such a critical industry that affects really all of us in every borough. David, you know, I, I, as you look at the role of controller moving forward, what are some things that you think you would want to change or, or make better in the office if you were elected? Well, again, uh, I would uh, focus on um, on auditing outside contracts, which are now 20 percent uh, saving money, uh, having some of that work uh, done uh, by uh, by unionized employees. Uh, but certainly I would, uh, you know, laser focus, concentrating on uh, some of those outside contracts and looking for uh, for waste and uh, and fraud and saving money, uh, which we'll need uh, in our upcoming uh, budget. Uh, I would also, as I mentioned, uh, open up borough offices in every borough and have those offices uh, focused on uh, helping small businesses, whether it be uh, through uh, various programs at the federal, state, or city level uh, to help small businesses, to help bring back the economy. Uh, so those are two things that I would do a little differently uh, than, has, than has been done by uh, former controllers. Great. Where, where do you think in the future the city should be investing its money and what side, where should we be divesting our money? Well, you know, uh, three of the uh, five pension funds, uh, you know, announced that they're going to be divesting uh, from fossil fuel. Uh, again, uh, I think it's important that the trustees uh, participate in that process because, uh, you know, they usually represent uh, their members. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not my money. It's not the controller's money. Uh, it's really the retiree's money. And I think it's important that they, uh, that they be part of the process. Uh, so uh, as long as the uh, pension funds uh, signed off on it and, uh, you know, there are alternatives in investments that will uh, try to get returns uh, similar or, uh, or better, uh, you know, that's a good thing. My primary obligation uh, as a fiduciary uh, for the pension funds, and they're now totaling uh, over $240 billion, which is, you know, almost a uh, uh, a quarter of a trillion uh, dollars, uh, one of the largest uh, pension systems. If you combine the uh, the five pension boards' uh, assets, um, you know certainly uh, I think it's important that uh, we try to get the best return on the assets because we all know that if they don't have uh, the guaranteed return, uh, the city has to make that up, uh, and that's going to have a you know a spiral effect uh, you know uh, on everything. So uh, so I'm committed to trying to get the best returns. I'm not going to use the pension funds, uh, you know, for political purposes or uh, to make social uh, statements. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned in the case of the fossil fuel, uh, that uh, as long as it's signed off on by them, uh, that's that's a positive thing. But uh, in general, I won't be looking, uh, you know, to divest. I'd be looking uh, to get the best returns on the assets. And, and the key, I think, is uh, diversification. Uh, I learned that from my Wall Street career. I also chaired the Security Industry Association New York District uh, trade group for three years, uh, overlapping with my uh, Wall Street career. Uh, and I think it's important uh, that we diversify our portfolios and, and uh, constantly uh, change asset allocations, constantly uh, look at new areas to invest. Uh, you know, there is uh, something called the Economically Targeted Investment uh, Program, where you can invest up to 2% of the assets in, in, in economically targeted investments. Uh, that could be used uh, uh, to build uh, affordable housing. But what I'd really like to see uh, is middle-class housing uh, for city employees, because there's a major problem with city employees not being able to uh, live in the city. You often have uh, a teacher married to a police officer or uh, married to a firefighter. Uh, they're both making decent salaries, uh, but they can't afford to live in New York City. We want to encourage our public service servants to live in New York City. We want to encourage our police, fire uh, teachers to live in the city. Uh, and uh, I'd like to maybe use uh, some of those uh, good investments, targeted investments uh, to build housing uh, for city employees. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't like... Uh, some of these long-term, these temporary homeless shelters and spending billions of dollars on that, uh, which is very costly. I think we could certainly, uh, you know, provide, uh, you know, services, uh, you know, uh, for 
some of these formerly uh, formerly home former homeless, a lot of them uh, need mental uh, health services, and we should be uh, providing that as opposed to warehousing uh, individuals in in the shelter system. Uh, and I think it's important uh, that we build uh, long term uh, affordable housing. All, all sounds great. I know. I think your mom just turned ninety, if I'm correct. My mother just turned ninety one. Uh, she's actually um, a Cuban uh, Jewish immigrant uh, to uh, to the city. She came here at the age of eight, uh, didn't speak a word of English, went to our public schools. Uh, she went to CUNY, where she met my father at Brooklyn College. Um, and um, she has a pension now. She's a teacher's pension. She became a teacher. She was a public high school teacher, uh, Jamaica High School, Long Island City High School. And uh, she's relying on her pension now. And uh, I'm going to protect her pension as well as the... Uh, over 700,000 other retire, active retirees uh, in New York City. So uh, uh, yes, uh, we're very proud of, of her. And uh, she, you know, as I mentioned, she just turned 91. God bless her. Well, my mom just turned 83 a couple of months ago and she's a local 372 retiree. And, and the pension <coughs> is important. And uh, not just the pension, but the health benefits and everything. So. It's critical that the controller's office continue to focus on that. And, and I know that the retirees listening in will be thrilled to hear that. Um, you know, just a couple of technical questions before we before we go. Um, you know, the the controller's office is important to contractors. Um, how do we address the the issue of on-time payments for contractors? And particularly it's affecting many of the MWBE companies and some of the smaller companies out there. Yeah, actually it was a big problem when I was chair of the finance committee, the city council. Uh, Not-for-profits uh, had to lay out the money and wait to get reimbursed. Uh, and not-for-profits were actually performing services uh, that uh, you know could have been performed by city agencies, but they couldn't do it uh, as effectively. And we contracted out to uh, not-for-profits. Uh, and uh, they couldn't afford to lay out the money. And I can't tell you when we had, you know, uh, a lot of not-for-profits getting member items, some of them said to me, and many of them said to me, you know, uh, you know, thank you, but no thank you. I, I can't wait, you know, uh, six months to get paid. And uh, they really should all be paid within 30 days or uh, at the outside 60 days. So uh, it was a problem back then when I chaired the finance committee in the city council, 2002 through 2009. I understand it's only gotten worse. Uh, and we really have to streamline the process. Uh, we have to, uh, you know, have a whole uh, division in the controller's office to uh, to make sure that uh, we streamline the process and people get paid within 30 or 60 days. Uh, it's really unacceptable. It's not a way for the city to do business. Uh, and I will uh, be committed uh, to doing that. Uh, it, it has a tremendous cost uh, to uh, these not-for-profits and uh, to a lot of the MWBE uh, uh, business enterprises that you mentioned uh, who can't afford to lay out the money. Uh, so uh, I think that should be a priority uh, and I will make it a priority uh, as controller. Great. And, you know, the, the contractors, the engineers, the architects, our members, they, they all also continue to run into the problem with payments at times. So it's a critical issue. Yeah, the, the controller also has a prevailing wage division uh, where they're actually... Um, uh, supposed to be uh, supposed to be enforcing and investigating uh, the enforcement of prevailing wage uh, on public projects, uh, and that's something that I'm committed to uh, strengthening. And as we, you know, get that infrastructure money, uh, we want to make sure that uh, you know that when people are supposed to get prevailing wage, uh, you know that that they they get it. And uh, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, you know uh, development and projects that uh, will be coming. Uh, to New York City, which we need uh, with the stimulus money. And it's a question of, uh, you know, trying to put that money to work uh, very quickly. I agree. And, you know, the prevailing wage issue is a, a big concern and the enforcement of it. So I'm glad you're, you're focused on that. So uh, we have a question from a, a guy named Mark Weplin. You may have heard of him. Uh, and, and it's a question that, you know, we've been talking about a lot. So if we get, or I should say, when we get, federal stimulus dollars. Where do you see the controller's role in making sure that we're funding not just the big highway projects, which our members love, but also things like sewers, 
and public housing and hospitals and, and things like that. Open oh, space, MTA. Absolutely. Uh, well, you know, MTA obviously got a, a huge stimulus uh, package. I think it was about six billion dollars uh, from the federal government, uh, even before uh, you know the last stimulus package. So uh, you know, we need to make sure that that uh, you know um, money is used uh, properly, and uh, and certainly uh, you know putting people to work and uh, and, and 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 allocations. Um, there's uh, you know there's a lot of that stimulus money that we should be looking at. And, and obviously it uh, can't be done in a vacuum. I think we have to get all the, you know, uh, the great uh, individuals we have in the city, uh, you know, to basically, uh, you know, be consulted uh, on it. But, uh, you know, I think uh, the most important thing uh, is to, um, you know, get people back to work uh, to, uh, you know, to do, uh, you know, use that money uh, properly and, uh, and obviously, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, New York City, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, that stimulus money. And uh, and I think with the infrastructure bill, uh, there's no question New York City should get, you know, uh, their fair share. Um, I, I'm also hoping that, uh, you know, with that infrastructure bill, we'll also repeal SALT. Uh, that's something that uh, Senator Schumer has been talking about uh, and uh, even uh, Speaker Pelosi, uh, even though it has been talking about doing that. And I think that's going to be a, a huge, uh, you know, benefit uh, to states like New York and uh, and California. And uh, you know, I think uh, it, it was obviously it never should have been repealed in the first place. Uh, and I think if we really want to, uh, you know, benefit, you know, from the stimulus money and uh, you know and increase our, our tax base, uh, we really should. Uh, and as you know, uh, you know, the legislature did increase uh, high end uh, taxes. Uh, Starting at two million for, uh, you know, joint filing, uh, that will significantly uh, ease the burden on some of our uh, high-end taxpayers that uh, could potentially leave uh, New York City and New York State uh, for lower income, lower uh, tax tax states like Florida. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, when we repeal SALT, and I'm hoping we will, uh, the, or Congress will, uh, that uh, that'll help uh, easing the burden on. Uh, on some of our uh, millionaires and billionaires, and uh, and not let them think about uh, leaving New York City and New York State, because uh, we can use their we can use their money and we can uh, use their taxes. Absolutely, um, you know, New York is known as a, a bureaucratic nightmare in many sectors. Um, I, I've read that you are proposing a red tape commission to cut through the complexity of the current bureaucratic process. Um, that's something that's very interesting. Give us a sense of what that looks like to you. Well, you know, again, that will also deal with the issue of, um, of vendors not getting paid uh, and, uh, and having to lay out the money. Uh, as I mentioned, everybody should get paid within 30 days uh, at the outset, uh, you know, on the outside at every six, within 60 days. So uh, it's, it's really unfair uh, to expect, uh, you know, our vendors uh, to, uh, you know, to lay out the money and, uh, you know, and not, uh, you know, and not get paid. So uh, certainly that's something we'll look at there. But I'd also like to, uh, you know, help the business community. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of these borough offices will, will be focused on, on helping the small business community. But we also want to help uh, some of the big businesses uh, and, and help them, you know, see what their needs are. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, there were a number of, uh, you know, short-sighted, uh, you know, uh, defeats and uh, in, in, in voting down or, or discouraging uh, a company like Amazon uh, from moving their headquarters here or the second headquarters. Uh, that was a huge mistake. Um, there were so many other large projects as well, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, were, were put on hold or, or, or not done because of uh, the city council voting against it. Uh, you know, I think uh, we really have to focus Post pandemic, uh, on bringing back uh, the business community. And uh, I will be uh, committed to doing that as one of three citywide elected officials, but also uh, as the chief financial officer of New York City. Well, it all sounds exciting. David Reflin, I know you're busy campaigning. The election is now less than two months away. Uh, what, what are you planning to do for the next two months? Give us, give us some ideas. 
Well, you know, uh, we're doing uh, a lot of Zoom events, but I think we're doing, we're starting to do more uh, in-person events. Um, and, uh, you know, we're getting out there. Uh, we're going to be, uh, you know, issuing policy statements and, uh, and ideas, uh, you know, on different issues. Uh, and then, of course, we're obviously going to be doing a media campaign. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are going to be doing direct mail as well as, uh, as, well as TV. And uh, we're going to try to get uh, our message out there. Uh, that we really have to, uh, you know, that you can't just uh, put somebody in the office of controller uh, as a consolation prize. That it's uh, it's a major office and becomes even more significant, uh, you know, post uh, the pandemic. Uh, and I'm committed uh, to using that office uh, to uh, help bring back uh, New York City. And uh, I do believe I have uh, the relevant finance experience, both public and private sector, to do that. Uh, and I will be getting that message out. Well, we thank you as always. I know you've always been a big supporter of the Golden Congress, and we look forward to working with you in the future. David Weprin, uh, good luck, and hopefully we'll see you out and about, not just on Zoom in the coming weeks. And everybody, as you know, yesterday we kicked off officially our 100th birthday. So a happy birthday to the Golden Congress. And we've got a lot of great things happening in the coming months. So check out our website, get involved, and, and help us celebrate. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Carla. Where, where's my espresso? My espresso. I already had two espressos this morning, so I'm a I'm a big fan. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.